Good evening, everyone. My name's Ellen davis Meehan. I'm your facilitator for this evening. My role is to keep things moving and give everyone a chance to uh, say what they want to say. Um, first, with some housekeeping. There are toilets outside and to the right. You came up in either the stairs or the lift. Uh, that's also our exit point. In the unlikely event that we will have to evacuate, the evacuation point is down behind the building and just follow the council staff uh, and we will look after you. This session is being live streamed on Facebook. So people will be able to watch um, from home. We have Mandarin and Greek interpreters here. I would ask them to stand up now, Stavros and... If anyone thinks they will need them, uh, you just put your hand up and the interpreters are going to come and sit with you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the purpose of this session is to provide you with information about where we're up to in the process of responding to the impacts uh, predicted and associated with the Northeast Link. Uh, we have a um, fairly tight agenda. We want to give you some input about where we're up to and the work that we've done. We're going to hear from our Mayor first and then our CEO and then our um, Coordinator of City Planning. So there'll be three presentations. I would ask you very kindly to hold your questions till the end because those three are then going to be available for a Q&A panel uh, that I will chair and we'll have roaming mics and we'll take questions from the floor. So in the interests of moving through that um, process, I'd like us not to ask questions during the presentation. Wait until the end and we'll have a session. If by chance you have to leave early, uh, we have outside at the reception, we have Sam sitting there, and she will take down any question that you want fed in to council if, if by chance you have to leave before the question time. We really want that question time to wrap up by about 7.05, uh, uh, from, from, it'll go from 7.05, sorry, to about, um, uh, it, we have a set time for it, because after that, and I've forgotten the time obviously, after that we want to have um, uh, time for informal mixing because you might want to ask specific questions to specific councillors or to the staff that are here. And we want to have some time um, for that one-on-one -on -one as well. Some of you might not like to um, uh, ask questions in public. You might rather ask a private one. So we'll be keeping to the agenda. That will be my role. And I know in all of my experiences with Manningham uh, and in the consultations that I've run, People are very respectful of each other. We don't all have the same view, but we will all listen uh, to each other and hear what everyone has to say. So I welcome you, and I would like to uh, call to the stage our Mayor, Councillor um, Paul McLeish, Mayor Paul McLeish, to start off proceedings properly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country this evening. Manningham Council acknowledges the Wurundjeri people as the traditional custodians of the land we now know as Manningham. We pay our respects to elders past and present and value the ongoing contribution to the cultural heritage of Manningham. I'd also like to acknowledge here this evening my fellow councillors, Councillor Goff, Councillor Zafropoulos, Chen, Piccinini, and uh, <laughs> uh, Councillor Haynes, who's down the back. Uh, we have um, Councillor Sophie Galbally is, is watching online. She couldn't be here this evening. And uh, Councillor Kleinert is also here this evening. And I'm fairly certain that Councillor Conlon is also in the electronic audience this evening. 
Uh, I'd also like to welcome our CEO here this evening. Welcome, Andrew Day. Our council also acknowledges the contribution made to Manningham over the years by people of diverse backgrounds and cultures. Thank you all for joining us this evening. As you know, Manningham is one of the most impacted councils with over seven years of construction in front of us, the acquisition of homes and businesses, the loss of over 1,200 jobs from the Bulleen Industrial Precinct, just to name a few of the impacts. The Victorian Government has been planning for the delivery of the North East Link since 2016. In November 2017, they decided on option A through Bulleen. And since that point, that's the only option we've been able to discuss with all of the subsequent processes. And we've been working since that decision was made to advocate for the best outcome for our community. And it's the best outcome in the context of what will be Victoria's largest ever road project. It was for a year after the announcement of the decision uh, that we saw numerous drafts of the environmental effects statement from the project proponents. And you would think that uh, having all of those volumes come forth that we'd have a significant amount of detail about the project, that we'd be able to understand the impact and the implications on our community. But that indeed is the problem that we face right now. We made a major commitment of resources on behalf of our community to present to both the government and the IAC our concerns regarding the significant impacts of this project. And in the IAC panel hearings, we made detailed legal submissions. And those hearings ran from July to September last year. Months of hearings, months of submissions. And the reality is that Despite all of that, we still lack certainty for our community. We still don't have a sound understanding of what the impact of the project will be because we have before us, in essence, a reference design. We don't have the ultimate design of what will be built. The IAC had a role which was to host public hearings on the draft environmental effects statement, the EES. And there were many submissions, not only from government, there were community members in the room here this evening who made submissions. Businesses and sports clubs, other councils, all presented at the hearing. They all presented their first-hand experience of what they believe will be the impact of this particular development. Once the IAC presented its report to the Minister, in December 2019, the Planning Minister reviewed the IAC report and produced his response to the EES. And that will, in essence, determine the way forward. And then under the Minister's response, Many of Council's concerns and advocacy requests were supported. Others were supported in part, but many still remain unclear. We were happy to see, for example, that uh, it, there were additional environmental performance requirements which provided for an employee assistance strategy for the impacted businesses in Bulleen. This was in direct response to quite a number of submissions, including ours. The Minister said every effort should be made to retain the Bulleen River red gum. That the road widening should be considered at critical locations and the Minister also requested nighttime noise limits be applied. However, there still remains no certainty 
on the outcome for the 1,200 jobs that may go in the Bulleen Industrial Precinct. The future of our community's parklands and sporting grounds and open spaces remains unknown, with no guarantees on how the issues will be addressed and when they will be addressed. Our challenge is that we have to have clarity from the North East Link Authority and the Department of Transport so that we know what will and won't be included in the project. We've asked for firm assurances, but the Victorian Government has not committed to anything. We will continue to work constructively with the North East Linked Authority, but we feel we had no choice but to challenge the North East Link environmental effects statements process, to challenge it with a judicial review. On the 11th of February, our council unanimously agreed to seek a judicial review into the IAC hearing process and into the minister's assessment of the North East Link EES. We did this along with Banyul, Burundara and Whitehorse councils because we want to know if the North East Link reports and decisions were lawful. We believe that the EES process should, should have been more rigorous and it should have been based upon a detailed design, not a concept. The decision to commence a judicial inquiry is in line with the motion of our 26th of September 7th council meeting 26th of September 2017 council meeting, where we resolved to support the North East Link proposal in principle, but we did not support the selected option A route through Bulleen until further information was provided to council in order to understand the impact and implications. The detail has not been forthcoming through the EES process nor the minister's assessment. So we believe it is now time for NELP to do the right thing for our community, to give us the guarantees and certainty on the project improvements which we have been asking for. We will continue to fight hard to ensure that we achieve the best outcome for the Manningham community. The directions hearing for this particular matter is now scheduled for the 24th of April. And if we could just go back a couple of slides to that timeline. You'll see here, when we go to the Supreme Court, what will happen if we are, we are assess essentially asking that the process go back to the beginning of the environmental effects state, uh, statement process because with the final design for the project. We do not get to go back before that. We don't get to go back and reconsider the route decision. The only thing that, would, that we would be able to appeal within the court case is the process that's been adopted and the process that uses the reference design. And that's where we go back to. So with that said, what I'd like to now do is hand you over to Andrew Day, our Chief, our CEO. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor, and thank you everyone for coming out uh, this evening. The Mayor's touched on a little bit of this, but what I want to do is focus on, um, just briefly, the judicial review. Um, and it's important to note that the judicial review um, component has occurred after we had this forum booked in for you as a community, and so um, we're obviously happy to inform you in terms of where that is at. However, the focus still should be on the sort of information that the Mayor has spoken about in terms of the key issues that are of importance to the Manningham community. And after me, um, Frank will highlight those uh, in more detail um, to you so you can understand the implications of the project. The judicial review challenges, as the Mayor has said, the decision-making process, not the merits of the decision. It won't necessarily stop the project, but it will ensure that the decisions that were made uh, to pursue the project were lawful. 
If warranted, it could potentially open this decision, the decision maker up, the state government, to remake that decision. But as I said, it won't necessarily stop the project. Council believes it's a necessary investment and in the best interests of the Manningham community, businesses and environment to challenge the North East Link AES process with a judicial review. The judicial review is one more step in advocating for the best outcome for the Manningham community and the environment. The other thing I wanted to reinforce though is that in the meantime, council officers will continue to work with the North East Link to negotiate the best possible outcomes for the Manningham community. Council officers continue to have regular meetings with the North East Link project regarding matters such as the Bulleen Industrial Precinct and Webster's Road Feasibility Study, which we'll hear more about, the Bulleen Park Sports Group relocations, and any of the early works planning and communications. Officers recently presented to the consortiums, so they are the, the builders, etc., that on what council and the community are seeking to be addressed in the design and the construction work. So we're still actively working uh, behind the scenes to influence that process. And we'll continue to influence the consortia and the North East Link to get those best outcomes for the Manningham community. So as I said, uh, I needed to be brief because uh, it's a legal process uh, and this process has come on um, after we had this forum set and really, in my view, the most important part to hear uh, from this evening is Frank Vasilakis from our city planning area, who will take you through more of the details of the sorts of issues that we've been raising along the way for many years on behalf of the Manningham community. So thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. My name's Frank Vasilakos. I'm the coordinator of city planning here at Manningham Council. And I'm gonna run through some of the, the technical detail and um, an overview of the North East Link project um, before we commence over to um, our panel of questions. So I might just um, begin with uh, a bit of a summary of some of the pinch points or the main um, elements of the North East Link that are impacting uh, Manningham Council and the city of Manningham. And this location here, if you're familiar with it, that's the Eastern Freeway and the Bulleen Road and Thompson's Road intersection, looking in towards Bulleen and Marcelin at the top of the image there. And these are three of the facilities that will be uh, affected by the uh, new interchange of the North East Link with the Eastern Freeway at this location. So number one there is the Oval One at Bulleen Park in the city of Manningham, currently used by the Yarra Junior Football League. Um, that's going to be acquired by the authority to build the entrance to the tunnels. And the purple line there delineates uh, the boundary between the city of Manningham and the city of Burundara. Over number two is the Burundara Tennis Centre. Um, and number three is the freeway golf course, which will um, ultimately have um, several uh, holes in that golf course lost to accommodate the interchange at this location. Another main part of the project that will be of um, significant impact into Manningham is um, at the Manningham Road and Bulleen Road interchange. Uh, here is an image of the industrial precinct at that location where there are approximately um, 100 businesses uh, located in that precinct and over 1,200 jobs. As part of the project, the entire precinct or a majority of the precinct will be acquired to accommodate a large interchange at this location in order to build ramps and tunnels down into the uh, tunnel um, below this, this point. This precinct will also become um, a key construction compound during the, the works. So another part of our community that we're uh, strongly advocating to support um, in this tough um, moment. Another point is the, the North East Link project is essentially two projects. One is to build a new freeway connecting uh, the ring road up in Greensboro down to the Eastern Freeway. And the other part of the project is to widen the Eastern Freeway to accommodate the extra traffic that's going to be generated by the project. So between Burke Road and Springvale Road, um, the, the indication there is that there's going to be significant um, in, uh, widening of the freeway between that point 
to accommodate additional lanes, but also to accommodate a um, Doncaster busway, which will be a dedicated busway between um, Hoddle Street and Doncaster Road. So what did Council go through over the last 12 months? So at the end of last year, after the panel uh, considered the, um, the EES process in July to September, uh, the Minister for Planning, and Mr. Um, Richard Wynne, uh, released his assessment on the North East Link project. And that assessment is um, contained 29 recommendations, which uh, some of them were somewhat favourable, but there was not a lot of information in there again for Council to feel comfortable um, that um, all of our issues and concerns had been addressed. So the minister made his own recommendations based on the recommendations he was provided by the uh, inquiry and advisor committee panel um, after taking those into consideration. So some of the key recommendations made by the minister in his uh, report is to review the Eastern Freeway width. And a lot of this work um, that I'm about to outline, um, council um, did have a a large amount of ex expert witnesses and support during the EES process to advocate on behalf of all the matters that um, were core to our community here in Manningham. And these are some of the responses in, in, in regards to that process. So um, a, a response from the a recommendation by the Minister was to review the Eastern Freeway width. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in some parts it could expand up to 18 lanes wide in Bulleen. Um, so council is quite keen to ensure that doesn't enroach into residential areas and public open space more than it needs to. Also investigating um, alternative options to um, unlock land for industrial uh, land uses. So obviously, as I mentioned before, the Bulleen Industrial Precinct um, is, a, is a key uh, industrial precinct in Manningham and there's not much more land elsewhere to offset that loss. There was also support to look at an alternative uh, arrangement and design for the Manningham Road interchange um, to look at reducing its footprint and also um, looking at opportunities to provide support packages to the uh, countless workers and uh, traders um, who are going to be impacted there at the industrial uh, precinct in Bulleen. Also, Council uh, uh, was strongly advocating um, improved groundwater uh, modelling as well as part of the project um, and immediate tree planting to commence due to the number of trees that will be removed to enable the project to progress. Some elements of the recommendations that were unclear was there was no real definitive outcome for managing the impact to Bulleen Park. And I'll explain what some of those um, impacts are in a minute um, to Bulleen Park in more detail. And also, um, there was mention to um, take every possible um, consideration of the Bulleen River red gum, which is um, a very large and significant 400 plus year old tree located within the Caltex petrol station uh, down on um, Bulleen, near the Bulleen Road interchange. What was also released as part of the process and um, Council had an involvement in trying to influence was the environmental performance requirements. Now without going into too much jargon on the process, essentially what the EPRs, and environmental performance requirements are, they're considered somewhat the planning permit conditions for the North East Link project. Um, they are in place to control many elements of the um, outcomes um, to the community and the environment. Um, including air quality, land use, um, and also uh, mitigating the impact to the Bulleen Industrial Precinct businesses and traders. Um, as a result of Council's advocacy during the EES process, many of the EPRs were strengthened, um, and Council were quite influential in, in getting um, some, some decent outcomes in making those a lot more prominent. There were also um, some positive outcomes for uh, mon monitoring uh, timelines and tree planting locations. And as I've mentioned, um, one of the key aspects is um, assisting all those businesses and traders who will be um, impacted in Bulleen. So some of the advocacy we have been undertaking through the EES process and more broadly, um, even to this moment um, today, 
is looking at uh, the Manningham Road inter interchange and seeing how that design can be refined to make it more functional for vehicle users, but at the same time ensure there is enough land left over to return that precinct into some form of useful um, land use. And also take every effort to avoid the loss of that um, significant tree um, there at the um, interchange as well. In terms of the Eastern Freeway, um, Council have been very strongly advocating for a more refined and leaner Eastern Freeway design, um, and essentially to um, minimise the impact to adjoining residents. Uh, the freeway is quite wide in the area around Estelle Street in Bulleen and along other parts of the alignment. Um, and also there are significant amounts of vegetation and open space to be lost along that um, corridor as well. And we're also strongly advocating for improved noise mitigation measures um, and air quality monitoring along that to not uh, further adversely affect the residents in that um, corridor. Other elements of Council's advocacy has also involved um, broader master planning of Bulleen Park and also identifying alternative off offset sites to make up for the loss of that um, oval one in Bulleen. Now that's been quite a complex process in itself because it's not essentially um, a situation where we just find another location to build a football oval. Um, there is a bit of a domino effect when you start shifting um, a few of the sporting grounds around. And I'll, I'll touch on that in just a minute. Council has also been strongly advocating for um, several kilometres of additional shared paths and pedestrian and cycling connectivity throughout the whole corridor. Uh, Earlier last year, Council adopt, uh, endorsed the Yarra River Corridor Concept Plan, um, which essentially outlines um, opportunities to improve walking and cycling connectivity along the entire Yarra River Corridor between Bulleen all the way out to Lower Templestowe, with additional walking bridges and connections across the river into Viewbank and um, East Ivanhoe. And we're also keen to ensure there's a more focused urban design strategy that drills down into the detail about how the project will deliver urban design outcomes that are favourable to the community. As I mentioned earlier, um, we're expecting to lose 12 out of the 13 hectares of industrial land in Manningham from Bulleen. So Council's been working quite avidly to uh, look at alternative opportunities to offset some of that loss. And one of the sites we've identified is in, on Webster's Road in, Temp in Templestowe, which is just a, a couple of k's north of the Pine Shopping Centre. Now this site is owned by Council and we've been working with um, relevant stakeholders and the State Government to look at opportunities to rezone this land to provide additional um, in industrial land. However, there are some major challenges with this project and I'll, I'll touch on that in just a minute as I get through um, the next stage. But one of the, one of the largest impacts um, in this location is that the, the, this site is currently outside of the urban growth boundary. That boundary is a line that basically ens encircles all of Melbourne that says development can't approach beyond that. So that's a big um, hurdle that Council has to overcome with the assistance of the Minister and, and State Government. We're currently undertaking the detailed feasibility study on this option um, and Council would, will consider that um, in, in coming weeks as part of our advocacy process. Another key element that we want the North East Link project to consider is an upgrade of Templestowe Road. So Templestowe Road, as some of you might be familiar as locals, um, it's, it, it's quite a substandard road for, for a municipality like Manningham where we're quite developed. So we're advocating quite strongly that the project becomes part of the North East Links remit and they deliver the upgrade um, as, part of the, uh, as part of those works. So what the upgrade entails is a duplication of the road to four lanes, a new shared user path along the entire three kilometre length to provide uh, a commuter route for cyclists and uh, pedestrian connectivity, new pedestrian signals near Heidi Museum and generally better improve, a greater improvement of pedestrian safety and crossings along the whole length of Templestowe Road to cross over from the uh, residential area in Bulleen to the parkland and the museum on the other side. And also, uh, again, those uh, who live in that precinct, in that area of Bulleen, it's sort of a, a black spot in terms of public transport. There's no real bus services. So Council's been, um, through the North East Link, but also through the Department of Transport, strongly advocating for additional bus services to service this part of uh, Manningham as well. 
So as I mentioned, Bulleen Park is one of the um, more challenging areas that we've faced as a council to address some of the issues. Um, unfortunately, one of the elements of the North East Link project is it's imposed this imposition on both um, the City of Manningham and the City of Burundara to address how the project um, um, impacts this part of the two municipalities. So in the EES process, uh, the option that was supported by the panel and by council is to look at option four. And what option four um, um, addresses is to retain um, the area that's currently used by the aero modelers and the archery and not lose that to an expansion of the, the freeway golf course. And also look at reconfiguring Bulleen Park to uh, accommodate the loss of the football oval at that location. But then that knockoff effect um, then requires the soccer pitches in that location to be located elsewhere. So as part of that, Council have identified an offset site um, on Templestowe Road in order to build um, two soccer pitches, which I'll run through on my next slide. But one of the things we wanted to point out is that we, as Council, we support the retention of the golf course, um, but not at the expense of um, enroaching into the city of Manningham further into um, land that is currently publicly accessible to aero modelers and archery for community use. So this is just an image um, from the North East Links documentation that shows um, Bulleen Park looking south. So that's Bulleen Road there. And in the forefront of that photo are the, the school grounds around Trinity and Marcelin. And as you can see, the entrance of the tunnel um, is just to the uh, right of where it says A, and that's an area that's gonna be significantly impacted. So that's where council are quite keen to get the, the best outcome for the community um, as a result of the project. As I mentioned, as part of the offset opportunities uh, for the impact to our sporting fields, council have been working with various stakeholders to um, provide two to three new soccer pitches at what is currently the Bulleen driving range on Templestowe Road. The, the reason for this site being selected is that it currently has a public acquisition overlay um, that applies to it, um, and that was, that's a historical acquisition overlay that the state government has put in place to um, one day acquire that land for open space and recreational purposes. So it was considered suitable in that nature. It looks at relocating the soccer facilities from Bulleen Park, as I mentioned a little earlier, and building um, all the associated infrastructure and services that you need to support um, modern day uh, sporting and recreation facilities. So the necessary car parking, pavilions, um, and also access to public transport. This, this opportunity is also linked with the reason why Council is strongly advocating for an upgrade of Templestowe Road. The project is expected to generate more traffic demand um, along that corridor, and also subsequently, the identification of um, the development of such precincts will also encourage further um, activity in this area, be it through vehicles, people wanting to get there by walking or cycling, or by public transport. So therefore, we, can, we want all those elements considered in any part of the upgrade of Templestowe Road. So in terms of what this means for the community over the next 12 months, what you will see um, out there at the moment, you may have seen it at the moment, is what they call, the North East Inc is calling early works. And these are works to prepare for the major works that will come from next year. These early works um, are mainly focused around relocating utility services, sewerage lines, power lines, water pipes and the like, um, to make way um, and provide a clear path for uh, the project to, to commence when uh, the state government awards the tender. So a lot of these projects um, above ground, might just, you might just be seeing um, work crew there putting in boreholes and access pits, but a lot of the work is happening underground, um, which is out of sight of a lot of people. But one of the, the matters that council have been strongly advocated for is that um, as part of these early works, streets and roads are not blocked permanently um, and, and um, restrict access to people's homes. And that if in the event restrictions have to occur, that residents are informed well in advance to uh, be able to plan ahead. So in terms of what to expect moving forward on the project, um, in the second half of this year, 
we expect that the state government will award the tender for the primary package. What that means is the uh, main part of the project, which is building the twin six kilometre tunnels um, underneath the Yarra River and underneath Eubank and Bulleen. Um, so that is expected to be awarded in the second half of this year, and we expect construction to commence early next year. These are the timelines, timelines being worked to at the moment, but given um, Council's um, judicial review and also the current climate with what's happening around the globe, um, the, you know, the timeframes could blow out, but these are the timeframes we're working to at this moment. So as we've mentioned, you know, the, the North East Link project is a state government led project. Uh, council, all the four councils, including Manningham, are one of the key stakeholders in the project. So um, the North East Link Authority, uh, project authority, will be hosting um, additional information sessions um, on the next steps of the project. There's one coming up on uh, this weekend in Watsonia, and there will be two further ones held in early April um, in the city of Manningham. Those, are to still, those dates are still to be confirmed, the ones in Manningham, so just keep an eye out on the North East Link website if you're interested in attending uh, those events. If you have any questions about the North East Link project itself, we do recommend you direct those to the North East Link project authority themselves. The reason for that is most of the questions will be better answered by the authority delivering the work. Obviously, if there's count, um, questions you have specifically for council-related matters, please refer those through to us. I will put these details back up uh, towards the end of the night if you wanted to take those down. That's the end of my section of the presentation, so thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Um, while the panel takes the uh, stage and brings a microphone or two, I'll explain to you the process. If you need to have a quick stretch or a, a wiggle, uh, now's a good time. Uh, I sh should have reminded people to uh, turn off their mobile phones, so if you can take this opportunity to do a quick check of that as well. Um, how this next bit is going to work is Q&A from the floor. We have two roving mics with uh, Karen and Jude, one on each side of the room. Can you please speak to a mic, a microphone when you have your question because it's really important and it'll make it flow better if everyone can hear that question. Questions will come through me. We're going to generally follow the council um, process for doing these questions where we'll have two per topic uh, so that we don't get stacked with a whole lot of questions uh, on one particular thing and then we don't get to time to deal with other things that people want. And we really want to get through it so we can, you can have one-on-one -on -one time with your councillors and with the officers um, that are here. I'm going to take the questions in two parts um, just for the ease of making this flow. The first thing, the first part I'd like to say, does anyone have any questions about the process that we're in with Nell, where we're up to the judicial process? because we can't say a lot about that judicial process. So if we could get those questions uh, off the books early and ask those questions first, if you have one, then as soon as um, we've spent a little bit of time on that or what's necessary, um, we'll take general questions on impacts and advocacy issues. Does that make sense? And I might just remind you too, because you might have read something about a bit of a virus going around, that there are tongs for the food. Um, so uh, just use those, um, please, and, and in, enjoy the food at your leisure and hopefully with the councillors and officer staff at the end of the night. So first of all, questions on the process that we're in first before we get to the, the other things. Just here, please, Karen. And if you come from a community organisation or you're representing somebody or you're from the minister's office, can you just please declare, give your name and say, this is where I'm from, because we all want to get to know you as well. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Helen Sitsubis. I'm a resident of North Borland. Can everyone hear that? Can you hear? Is the mic on? Oh, can you hear now? That's better. Sorry. My name is Helen Sitsubis and I'm a resident of North Borland. I actually had an email this week from the Burundara Mayor and it concerned the Manningham Mayor and the Manningham Council. And she basically, I asked her if she would advocate, advocate for some design changes. And she said, and I'm quoting her, from her email, 
any public statements have to be run past lawyers. We will be saying very little until the case in the Supreme Court is heard. All councils in the coalition are in this position. So that's the four. As the old saying goes, loose lips sink ships. And we do not want to say anything that could compromise the court case. So that was the response from the Burundara Mayor. I'm actually in Burundara. It seems a little bit different to your approach, which is great, is to be very inclusive. But I just wanted to see if you could verify that any public statements have to actually be run past the lawyers at this stage. I think that's the question that... Who would like to take that? Andrew? I'm happy to take that question. Thank you for the question. Um, I suppose what I would do is reinforce that um, what we are talking about here and what we've presented to you here tonight is actually all publicly available information. So what we are doing is summarising the information predominantly that we have presented through the EES process, um, as each council did. And so if you've um, got a spare moment and really want to go and read through the transcripts, they're all there uh, on record anyway in terms of what we're talking about here tonight and indeed um, many years' worth um, of work. Insofar as the agreement around the legal process, um, what we have agreed upon as four councils is that through the CEOs, we would uh, agree collectively on um, any joint media releases as it relates to the legal case itself. So that's the um, agreement that we've got. Obviously, because uh, it is a legal process and because we want to make sure that we are consistent across each four councils in the advice that we're giving. Thank you, Th and thanks for the question. Any other questions about the process that we're in before we go to impacts and advocacy? Yes, please. Thank you. Hi, my name's Meredith. I just want to know why the route option that was chosen is not included in this review, judicial review process, because I think that was of concern as well. Yes, I think Andrew spoke to that when he talked about going right back to the beginning. Can again? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, the reality is the process that we're going through, um, as I explained during my presentation, doesn't actually involve challenging the, um, the route and indeed the whole EES process that we've worked through, and the panel were very clear on this right from the start as well, was did not allow the opportunity to challenge the route that was chosen. It was all around focusing on that route up through Bulleen. And so the opportunity to challenge the route was not there, as I said, through the AES process, and it is not there and available to us through the judicial review process either. Thanks, Andrew. OK, I think we'll move to... Is this on the process or impacts? OK, last one on process, then we'll move to impacts. Hello, my name's Simon. I just wondered, have you got a date for the hearing in the Supreme Court yet? Thanks for the question. Uh, 24th of April was the directions hearing. Um, and effectively, you know, that, that just sets the scene, if you like, for uh, the actual case itself. So that's our kind of starting date, if you like. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Questions and comments on impact issues, advocacy issues? Directed to our panel. This is, this is a surprise. <laughs> I know the presentations are wonderful. I, well, while you're thinking about that, let me say, if you're anything like me and you have problems concentrating, Frank's whole presentation is available for you to download and read through at your leisure. Uh, and also, if that's not possible for you, if you don't have access to that kind of facility, you can ask Sam on the uh, reception desk on your way out and we will organise it uh, for you. For those who are following along at home and also you, you can email questions. There's capacity to email questions and the council officers will review those. So if you're feeling shy, that's OK. There'll be lots of opportunity. Question here. Yes, please, sir. Just to your right, Karen. <laughs> I think it's an impact question. Frank, we live near the northern end of Springvale Road. Now, I realise that Templestow Road is going to get a lot of attention. Templestow Road becomes Foot Street, which becomes Reynolds Road. 
And at the end of Reynolds Drive, you've got a single line up to Warrandot. You've got a single line to no into Springvale Road North. I can just see an awful lot of traffic coming up the extended Temple Stay Road, Foot Street, Reynolds Road, and then they're going to hit the northern end of Springvale Road, which at the moment is pretty awful. Have we given any opportunity? Have we been given any opportunity to talk about Springvale Road North? Uh, thank you for the question. So, as part of the documentation that was released, traffic modelling was provided, and we thoroughly analysed that. Um, from memory, I believe there was um, minor increase in traffic volumes along that section of uh, Springvale Road. Unfortunately, that project, that section of the um, municipality is somewhat beyond the scope of what the North East Link project will consider as part of their project remit. However, Council's ongoing advocacy as part of our uh, arterial road strategy is to seek a, an upgrade of that road um, through the state government, but that will be done through other channels, not through the North East Link. Thank you. There was a question over this side, please. Thank you. And then we'll take you, sir. Um, I just wanted to ask, I understand, obviously, the judicial process will delay things. When are you actually expecting a final, or a rough month or whatever, a final, this is what we're doing and this is how wide it'll be? And how long do you think it'll delay it because of the d judicial review? Who would like to take that? Andrew, thank you. I'll start with the uh, judicial review. It's, it's hard to tell um, what that will mean in terms of uh, the project and the project timelines, um, because the reality is, um, as I said before, the um, directions hearing is really just the start of the process. It then has to be decided upon on when it will be heard, and, and so we actually don't know uh, that exact date. Um, but in terms of the timing, maybe if you, Frank, you could just reinforce what, what some of those timings are if, if all things continues to go to plan for the project. Yeah, sure. So um, the directions hearing will set the tone and, and outline um, when the actual hearing will occur. Um, in many cases, Supreme Court hearings take quite a long time. There's quite a lot of it's a it's quite a big process. However, uh, we do understand that it may be expedited given the significance of the project. So potentially mid year, we expect something, but we we don't know for sure. Um, however, in terms of uh, the judicial review process, um, our understanding at this stage is planning for the project will still continue business as usual um, in, in, in that same time, so. So when will it look like us will see what the actual eight lanes, nine lanes, and ten lanes is? So one of, the, one of the issues we have is exactly that, that with this design is based on a reference design and it doesn't, it doesn't give you the detail. It would, it, it would be expected that uh, later this year or early next year, I believe that we might be seeing some more detail um, in, in that design. And that's the part we're challenging, that we want to be able to influence that at that point in time. Thank you. Uh, just in front of Karen, yes, please. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, it's Matt Gold. I want to know about... A bit the... closer. Uh, I want to know about if you have any parallel uh, plan if you face to unexpected things such as contamination salts, as we see in the Bayskate tunnel, uh, do you have any plan when you face with these uh, things and uh, don't to have a, a halt and a stop for a long time? Thank okay. you so much. So contingency planning and contamination and surprises. Yes, what's thank the plan you. for That's surprises? Quite a valid question given what's happening um, elsewhere in Melbourne. So again, as part of the EES process, a big element of that was looking at contaminated land and doing quite significant assessments to determine um, if there is contaminated land. Uh, the difference with Westgate is that that runs through sort of in former industrial precincts, so um, th there could be surprises there. However, um, a lot of that responsibility falls on the contractors and that's what the environmental performance requirements would dictate, that they have to um, make sure they have the right mitigation processes in place. In the first instance, they'll have to make sure they do the right testing to determine that. Um, so it's un it, we, we can't say if it's going to be an issue or not, but there are processes in place to avoid that happening. And given what's happening with the Westgate, I assume there will be um, a lot more attention and focus on making sure that doesn't happen this time around. Okay, I've got one on the left here, and oh. then you, madam. Hello. Uh, Quam Salada, I live 
near the Eastern and Blackburn Road. So the whole thing doesn't altogether affect me. But I'm for it. Uh, not necessarily A. Uh, B or C was probably the one that I thought was the better one. And I see smiles, so someone else agrees. Um, my uh, question and wonder is, what is going to happen once it's all done? I might put my wheels up by then. But um, the uh, placarded trucks, where are they going to go? And um, I know uh, some of them have um, curfews during the night for trucks. Um, I was told at one of the meetings uh, they can't go down Heidelberg Road. They may have to go down High Street Preston. And High Street Preston is ridiculous. That's my question. Okay, who's going to take that? Might be a bit beyond council's remit, but give it a go, Frank. Yeah, um, so again, without deflecting the question, a lot of that responsibility will fall on the contractor to determine where to haul a lot of that uh, material. Um, and that will be outlined um, in the subsequent um, elements of the investigations that those contractors will do. Um, so in terms of placarded loads, um, I believe there are standards for what can or cannot go into the tunnels. So um, obviously they will need to find suitable routes and I believe a few of them have been identified on, on the arterial roads. So there is an element of managing that to make sure it doesn't disrupt traffic, it doesn't increase noise and it doesn't break curfews um, accordingly. Thank you. Just here on, on your left, Karen. Thank you. And then we'll take you, madam. I'm, I'm, and then you. I'm just wondering why we're using old solutions in building freeways. We've known for years that you build a freeway, you build it three lanes wide, four lanes wide, it fills up. You've got to make it six lanes wide, it fills up, you've got to make it eight lanes wide. We're looking at decarbonising our economy. We're looking at hydrogen fuelled vehicles. Why aren't we being smart about this? Do we actually need an eight lane freeway? Aren't we better off with looking at hydrogen buses, looking at putting a tramway or a train down the middle of the freeway to take people into the city? Why are we constantly building freeways? You know, let's be honest, this freeway is a wish list from the transport companies. It's a wish list from Toll and others. They just want to get around the city more efficiently. That is all it's about. It's not about people getting into the city any quicker. It is to fulfil the wishes of the transport companies. Thanks for that comment. That's, that's a big and important comment, so thank you for that. Um, it's outside of Council's remit, but does someone want to respond it's, out of that? It's uh, certainly a big question, and we're, we're all in a similar position here. The state government is the organisation that's made the decision to build this road. And the scale of the proposal is theirs and the outcomes will be theirs. As a council, we've always advocated for improved public, public transport to our city. We've been advocating for Doncaster Rail for many years. We're advocating for improved bus infrastructure within the new project. And our decision a few years ago to advocate for a bus rapid transit system as an interim step towards Doncaster Rail has been supported within the project. We are going, if the project's built as it's currently planned, we hope it will be, in, 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 to at least to some extent. Um, the busway will be introduced and we'll have a dedicated busway through to the city. But Unfortunately, you're asking us a question we can't solve. This is a state government project and a state government decision, and we're trying to mitigate the impact of that on our community, and that, that's the opportunity that we have as a council under the Act that this is all operating under. Thank you for raising that. Yes, and then we'll take this gentleman here and then two more up front, in the black. Sorry, I've got a queue system going in my head. It goes up to their left and then one, two. We'll hi come there. back to you last. Hi there. Um, Only because you've already spoken. Hi, my name is Stella Yi and um, thank you for this update and for your advocacy. I do have a question regarding the cost of legal action. Could, could you give us an idea about how much this is going to cost? Do you have an idea how much ultimately the legal... Um, uh, campaign is going to 
cost okay. to taxpayers. Thank you. Is that, can I just clarify that? That's a question about the cost of the legal action or a cost generally? The legal action, thank you. The, the indicative cost we have at this stage for the Supreme Court action, for the cost for our council, is of the order of $100,000 at this stage. Uh, but to some extent that will be influenced by the length of the case and the matters that are debated within that case. Thank you. Yes, up the back near Karen. Then we'll go to you, sir, and then in front. Hi, my name's Brendan. Thanks so much for this uh, organising this panel. It's, it's really great. Um, uh, my first... Well, my main question would be, I guess, around the impact moving forward for public transport. Is that something that's already in discussions about kind of mitigating what, what kind of impacts they will have into these next seven years? That's a frank... That's a frank answer. Yes, no, f fair question. Um, one of the main things that um, Council have been advocating for is no disruption to public transport services um, during the process. It's a seven-year project. Um, seven years is not temporary in anyone's um, eyes. So as part of the environmental protection... Um, as, sorry, part of the environmental um, regulations, um, there is a mandate that the public transport services are maintained. And we're working quite closely with the Department of Transport to look at opportunities for even promoting public transport during those disruptions to give people an opportunity to take buses and, and trams and trains in the, in the region uh, rather than drive if there is significant um, disruption to, to travel. Could you repeat that, please? Yeah, I guess... Uh, would that also lead to additional bus services as well if you were to, you know, suggest for people to use those methods? Because I'm very aware that these services can clog very easily. Yes, definitely. So one of key Council's key public transport advocacy, aside from the North East Link, is to seek um, investment and greater um, increase in services and capacity on our existing bus network, particularly the, uh, the smart bus services that operate in... Um, at overload in the mornings and the afternoons, so yes. We have two questions on this side. Thank you. Thank you. And three, maybe. Um, thanks. Um, I'm sorry, I'm late. My name's Kieran. Um, I don't know if this question has been, uh, this has been raised already tonight, but it was fairly obvious to me that when they chose this route to push cars through the Mullum Tunnel, instead of going around the back of Ringwood, it's all about the cost of the toll going through the tunnel. So this, this route they've planned and are going to go with are pushing cars through the Mullum Tunnel, which is the dearest part of Eastlink. If they go around behind Ringwood, you don't have to go through the tunnel. So my question is, I was very, very sus of this when I first heard about it, and then it was asked in yesterday's paper that the state government are going to run the tolls on this new Eastlink. Is it all tied up together when the contract was signed to build Eastlink and the Mullum Tunnels, how many cars going forward were to go through that tunnel every year to maintain the contract? Thus, like when Jeff Kennett signed off from Transurban, he left it open that, that one ton newts were open to discretion of how much they paid to go through the tunnels. I had a one ton ute, which I've just got rid of, thank God. I was paying the same as a B double truck to go through those tunnels. And I guess there's other tradesmen in this community who are going to be stuck with these tolls. And Jacinta Allen will not, will not say what those tolls will be to go through East Link, uh, through the new link, and then through the East Link tunnel to, hit, to go down south. Okay. Thanks for that. Thanks for that question. It's probably a bit beyond Council's remit because the no, state I government decision, but it'd be, uh, it'd be interesting to hear uh, how we deal with that and how we capture that in, in the process that we're in. Because it's going to cost money to use this, yeah. Yeah, to we, use this road. Yeah. And we, we, joining up with it already a road we have to pay on to use anyway, which we pay road taxes every year, is this yep. disgraceful? Yep. We certainly understand the, the question. Thank you for it. But we're all in the same boat. We all pay tolls. The council pays tolls on its council vehicles, on its council trucks. I've got a one-ton truck. I pay the same toll as you. And it's the state government's decision to charge tolls to construct these roads. That, the state government makes the decision 
to implement toll roads. And from that point on, it's the state government's responsibility and all of the things that flow from that are a result of the state government decisions. And we as a council, and we're in a, we lobby and we advocate, but we're not in a position to change their decisions. We can only try and represent the best interest of our community. And we do that as directly and as effectively as we can, but the decision makers in this case as to whether it's a toll road or not is the state government. And I'm afraid I have Thanks to leave Thanks for that. that. Sorry, Paul. That, that's a really important point and we've captured that. Thank you for that. Just my, the, the next... And certainly, and as Councillor Goff Jude. just pointed out, we are... We, we've been very concerned from the moment this road was announced to push very hard to ensure that the existing Eastern Freeway remains toll free. We have assurances in the reports from the government about that. But we will, in the end, we'll all only know the outcome when we see the road built and the toll, tolling gates go in place. Lady in the white jacket. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Cynthia Pilly. Um, I live in East Doncaster. <laughs> That's better, I think, isn't it? Um, uh, I'd just like to congratulate uh, the, um, the council on taking this legal action and looking at the issues that hopefully will be examined in that process. Um, I believe the cost will pale into insignificance when um, you think of the land values that will be lost if this goes ahead. In 2016, when the council agreed in principle to the North East Link, Climate change wasn't considered with the urgency that it now is. The popularity of the North East Link line on the map was substantial and came out of community frustration with getting around. Attitudes towards burning fossil fuels and air pollution, the impact on health are changing. It would be all but impossible to sell the building of a coal-fired power station now. Only a couple of years prior to this North East Link proposal, the Council rightly invested in the building of rail to Doncaster, preferably to Doncaster Hill. This had the capacity to take hundreds of cars off the freeway every trip. The North East Link, were it to go ahead, will kill off other rational transport solutions. Given that the Council has now expressed their concern for urgent climate action, it makes no sense that the council is still, still insisting that they support the North East Link project going ahead, knowing that new mega roads increase car travel and in a short space of time become congestors as well. That they have not and appear to have no appetite, and you appear to have no appetite, for challenging the Andrews government, a good government in many ways, to rethink a project that can only increase climate change and do nothing to provide alternatives for public transport. This feels like a betrayal. Why has there not been a challenge attempted? Since when did councillors just roll over to state governments and not consider their residents? Is, is that a question about... Well, sorry, I think I've, I think oh, I've got the Paul? question. Okay, thank you. Um, no, it's okay, thanks. Thanks, the, thanks. The council has made its decision, and the decision is to support the construction of option A. We're still fighting on the detail of that, but that is the council decision. There are many in our community who support the construction of a North East Link in some form. And... Sorry, we... You, Thank you, you're correct. We, su we, we supported a North East Link. We opposed option A. Thank you for the correction. That, that's correct. Um, and in the end, it's been the government decision. And there's a premise in your question that there, that there is a legal basis, there's a, that there's somewhere in law and a court where we can mount a challenge to the government's decision to do this. And there isn't. There's a flaw in your question, I'm afraid. We are exercising what is legally available to us, and that is to 
make uh, to apply for the judicial review. That's the process we're adopting because that's the legal avenue that's available to us. Thank you, and thanks for being so well prepared. We'll take uh, one here in the red, and then we'll go to you, sir. Thank you so much. I wanted to say thank you as well. In your overhead, you talked of the tree plantings that you've got that are immediate, so thank you. Well done on that. Um, could I just ask you to define a tree planting, though? Is it higher than three metres? Because we talk of the 26,000 trees lost, and they're defined as three metres or higher, which means trees that are below three metres or nine foot don't exist. So I'm just hoping the tree plantings you're negotiating aren't seedlings or saplings because they will not, they're not counted as a tree okay. in this whole process. A tree is defined as three okay. metres or taller. Thanks. So what is a tree planting that you have gained for us? Thank you for that. Thanks for that. Is that something for you, Andrew? Uh, that is something that takes me well beyond my area of expertise, I'd have to say. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll take that on notice because it's a reasonable question. We'll find out what that sort of detail is and we'll clarify that. And don't forget you can email questions in as well. I may not be the only one interested. I'm also interested in lots of other questions and grateful for your answers. So how will you disseminate if indeed that, you know, you can't answer straight yeah, away. Thanks for the question. So yep. we're likely to get questions also online. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll, where we've got similar questions, we'll aggregate those up and the response to that. And where we've got specific questions like yours, we'll just make sure they're available on our website um, at some point in time after the forum. Thank you. Up the back, please. And Hello. then, and uh, then you. My name's Steve. I live near the park and ride in Doncaster. Um, I know I'm going on the judicial review, and maybe you can't answer the question, but it seems to me that you've accepted that option A is going to be done, or it seems that way. What are the goals or aims of the judicial review if, if it's not to change it? What, you know, you, you're spending $100,000, and it seems to me... I'm, I'm, I'm a bit unclear of what you would consider a win or, what you, or your actual aim by doing it. OK. Thanks for that. So the aims, what we would consider a win from the judicial review? We, the judicial review is appealing the process and the process is framed around a, a concept and not an actual design. The problem that we have is that the tenderer will, pro, will propose a particular design which may or may not look like what we've all seen in all of the documents. And therefore, we don't know the impact. We don't know the outcomes for our community. So we would be keen, if the judicial review is successful, to see that the design put forward by the builder is subject to an environmental effects assessment and then we will be able to, and the community will be able to express their views on what is being proposed to be built. So that's the, that's the challenge that we all have. The reference design that we have seen does not represent what the builder will propose to build, as we understand it. Okay, thank you. In the middle at the back, and then we'll come to the front again. Hi guys, Kyle here from the Manningham Leader. Um, just wanting to confirm, um, can you confirm that the legal fees for this upcoming Supreme Court challenge are going to be um, funded out of ratepayers' money? And can you also advise if the council had, you know, had a, like some sort of a section in its budget planned aside for any potential legal challenges? Because I know there's obviously been already um, half a million spent on the. Um, previous inquiries. So I just wanted to know if you had, if you'd planned for this in your budget and yeah. Andrew, I think that's a question for you. So the first question we've already responded to in terms of the overall cost. Um, in terms of, well, it, it's funded by ratepayer money. The majority of our funding is actually ratepayer and rate rates funding. Um, 
I think that that would be fairly obvious to most people in the room. In terms of um, budgeting for that, we have legal um, budgets each year. Um, so we have budgeted for legal costs associated with the North East Link this year. Um, and obviously we've got contingency legal costs in any given year and we will budget uh, a necessary amount for the next financial year, recognising that um, we may not get to the actual hearing until the 2021 budget. Thank you. OK, we're on our last questions. Up the front here. Hello. Um, your presentation there mixes two processes. One's a North East Link process and one is a Bulleen Yarra process, precinct process. Um, the Bulleen Yarra um, precinct process is on hold at the moment and that contains the Yarra Valley Country Club, Templestowe Road, the, um, the driving range and all that type of stuff. When will the um, Bulleen Yarra uh, precinct process be put in place and re, uh, restarted and how does it actually um, mesh with the North East Link process? Thank you, fair question. Um, essentially, they're both linked and they're both sort of dependent on one another. Um, our understanding is the Department of Planning and Environment's um, Bulleen Land Use Framework Plan and Yarra, and Yarra Plan are um, due to commence in um, the middle of the year. I guess somewhat um, it needs to be dictated by the outcomes of the North East Link project as well because it's uh, quite intertwined in, in this, where it's um, affecting this part of the world. Media, where our understanding is. Is there anyone who ha hasn't asked a question yet, who's got a burning question, who hasn't asked one yet, that would like to? I'm just making sure everyone gets a go. Yes, please, sir. G'day, my name's Laurie. I wanted to, I wanted to know why the council haven't insisted with uh, the Link Authority on maintaining an easement for future railway to Doncaster. Okay. Why? Doncaster. Because Doncaster once Rail. the busway is done, nothing will ever happen. Yep. Frank? Thank you. So, um, as you're aware, Council's been strongly advocating for many years for a Doncaster rail link um, along the Eastern Freeway. Um, as part of the North East Link project, um, the, the, the freeway reservation will be, become a busway. However, what we've been advocating for is the transition of that busway into a heavy rail link um, in the future when the state government um, funds or has the appetite to deliver that project. Um, concurrently, at the same time, since that, this project, the North East Link project has come into play, the suburban rail loop project has also been um, announced, which looks at an orbital rail link around Manningham, uh, around Melbourne, including the station at Doncaster. Um, so there are elements of that project that might provide greater benefit to Manningham. Um, however, we're, we're advocating as a council for both projects to be delivered. Thank you, important question. Up the back in the in black, we haven't had a question from there yet. That side. Hi, I'm Ben, and that, that answer that you just replied to the question, um, basically, they're not the um, reservation in the middle of the freeway, that's actually going to become road, and they're going to move the <coughs> busway to the um, right-hand right side of the freeway, which um, now I have said that it's going to basically destroy the train line from even going that way. So. Um, do you have any idea on how you can actually, you know, convince them to allow it to still have a train line in the future? Thank you. Uh, yes, so uh, I should have clarified that point. Although the middle reservation is being lost, um, there will be a bu Doncaster busway um, being developed as part of it. What we're advocating for as council is that the design of that busway is done in a manner that can allow it to be transitioned to heavy rail in future when the time comes, when the project's funded, so that it doesn't preclude rail from the project. Okay, yes, here. And then we'll take you, sir, and then... then I think we're all going to be um, affected by this in one way or another, but the people I feel sorriest for are the ones at the Boleyn industrial area. Frank, I know the Webster's Road site 
and, and it's not a very big site, would it not would it have been possible to utilise the much more extensive area where there is a seed farm on the northern side of Reynolds Road, uh, 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 Temple Star Road, or is that a floodplain? Yep, so the seed farm is um, within a flood zone. It also is within the environs of the Yarra River and the state government's recent Yarra strategic plan has put in some significant um, buffers and boundaries for what kind of development can occur within the vicinity of the Yarra River to protect that as a um, environmental and wildlife corridor. So to build um, an industrial precinct in that location is, is probably not, the, um, not in, in line with um, those objectives. Thank you. Gentleman in the black shirt in the middle, Jude, just here. And then the lady in black in, on the aisle. Thank um, you. And then we'll wrap up. I think we've got to you for our last one. OK? Uh, my name is John. Um, I was just wondering, um, was our state representative in Matthew Guy, who uh, represents this area, is he uh, invited to these sort of um, gatherings at all? And, well, maybe in the future, if we do have these gatherings, he, he could be there because I say some of these questions could uh, be presented to him as regards to what might happen in the future. Our comms person up the front who does all the invites is nodding yes, definitely he's been invited. Uh, in, in black in the centre. Hello, uh, my, my name's Helen Fox and I live in Warrandyte. Uh, we went through the process of the A, B, C and D and then poor old A got picked. If, uh, if it had have come near my place, we would would have been looking at big smokestacks and big concrete and the whole of the whole of um, the, the Yarra Valley near where, where I live, which is beautiful. Um, I, I can't understand looking now at what's been happening with bushfires and climate change that this government is looking at putting in this awful great big concrete monstrosity to bring more cars to our area. It's, uh, it's not necessary. It could, I, I'm a small business and I used to travel in with my daughter on the Eastern Freeway and there would be three lanes of one car, one driver, one car, one driver and we would have two in our little truck in the T2 lane. Now if they put that train line down first before they start looking at widening roads, why haven't we got this railway now? It's not necessary to put in freeways like this because they've done it over on um, the Monash and it look at, you go on that now and it's clogged. Now we all should be standing up and saying, what's going to happen to our children? I look out this window here now and you can see the smog. Now, do we want more of that? And, and what's going to happen in the future? Climate change is real. We've hit 415 parts per million of CO2 now. And with the coronavirus and the money that's been thrown around over bushfires, it's the same billion, $2 billion that this government keeps, with current government, it keeps kicking it round backwards and forwards. Now, we have to stop and think, all of us, what, what, well, what are we leaving to the kids? And we don't need another freeway clog, clogging up um, our, our country, <laughs> our, uh, our neighbourhood. So, um, I'm very upset about what's been happening and with the coronavirus, what's going to happen with our economy? We're small business. We've ground to a halt. If, if, the whole, if the whole country grinds to a halt, where are they going to get the money from? Who's paying for it? This state thank, thank, government? Thank you for your question. We, I, understand, <laughs> I understand your concern. And thank you. I'm sure the residents and businesses in Bulleen are just as concerned about the impact of the option that the government's chosen as the residents would have been in Warrandyte with option C. In the end, as, I've, as we said earlier, we, we are all consumers of this project. We are all the people who will be impacted by this and we as a council are exercising the options that we have to try and mitigate the impact of it on our community by advocating as strongly as we can but we aren't in a position to, to stop the government from doing it. And I, I appreciate your concern, but the government's made the decision to move ahead with this and we are working for the benefit of our, our community as hard as we can. 
And thank you for your first statement. We'll take that on board. It's a very important one. And our last question here. Thanks very much. Um, yes, but it doesn't have to be like this. We don't have to have 20 lanes on the Eastern Freeway and spots. But my, my question was that, um, has there been any figures as to the amount of soil that will be dug out with the, from the tunnelling? And has there been any decision made about where that will be dumped? Um, and, but just also, people here need to know that uh, engineers have said that it can't be turned into rail because it will not be strong enough where it crosses over. It's in freeway to get into the Hoddle Street entrance and uh, it also will be too steep. Okay, Frank, thank you. Thank you. So on the um, uh, material being dug out, we don't have exact detail of how much material will be dug out, although um, there were measures uh, put forward in the EES process about how that will be managed, but that's something that the contractors um, will be managing uh, with the state government as part of the process. On your second question about the, um, the, the Doncaster Rail, um, again, we acknowledge um, that that is a challenge uh, to design the busway so that you can lay some tracks down tomorrow and turn it into a railway line. Um, however, um, our understanding is, in the first instance, it's been designed in a manner to not preclude rail. Um, however, at a later stage, I guess it will come to a case of retrofitting that um, when funding is available um, and there's an appetite by the state government to deliver a rail line to Doncaster. Thanks for that. I'm going to end this part of the meeting now and give you an opportunity to speak to your councillors. You all know who your councillors are. They're the kind of front row uh, here and, and one up the back uh, and the council officers that are here and I encourage you to eat all the food with tongs. I remind you that you can download Frank's presentation and that you can ask further questions on email. I want to thank you for um, the for your interest in the way you've participated tonight. And I'm sure all of the uh, councillors are very grateful as well, and, and as our council staff. So thank you for making the time for partnering with council in this big, big, big advocacy project and, reigning, and, and raising all those important questions. Everything that you've said tonight is really important. So thank you. Please eat all the food. Uh, and take an opportunity to follow up one-on-one -on -one with anyone that you want to. Thanks for coming and safe trip home.